So uh, we are reaching the end of the afternoon, and I think we are getting a bit sleepy after so many talks. And I think a good way to introduce you uh, is to talk about Maxwell equations with this very friendly introduction on the subject. So many of you are even trying to read this because it's really boring. So the first is Faraday's law of induction. The second is Ampere's law and so on and so on. And before starting anything, the first time I was introduced to Maxwell equations. Have you heard about Maxwell equations? Just heard. Yeah, okay, great. The professor came to the room, said good afternoon, and you know, he wrote these formulas and said this. What does it mean? I mean? Is this friendly? I wouldn't say so. What is this triangle? What is this point? What is this? So uh the, the effects of having such an introduction can be very diverse. So you can feel sleepy, you can feel like totally like a panda among the snow, or some of you might understand at the first glance. But what I want to talk about in this, in this talk is a little bit of my experience of learning or trying to learn science and so and I, I, I would like to share with you some of these points. So my name is Hanali. I am from Brazil, so sorry about my accent. Uh, it's, it's a long flight from Brazil to here. So yeah, I'm still in a bit of jet lag. Uh, I am a computer engineer. Uh, I do some sort of stuff in my free time. So uh, this talk is not about database, but I host some uh, database meetups in Sao Paulo about Neo4j, about Cassandra, about big data, about stuff. <laughs> Uh, I also like math and physics as a hobby, so I am, I don't know, I like to study things as a hobby. Uh, I like legal, uh, animals, meetups, coffee, and gifts. So we are going to see some gifts around the presentation just to be less boring. Uh, before anything, it's a disclaimer. Uh, I understand that we come from different cultures and we have different experiences. So my experience, my might have been different from yours. Uh, for instance, for example, I have some friends from Norway, and everything that I saw, that I see in this talk is not valid for them, because their educational system is way different from what I have in Brazil. But I gave this talk in the United States, and we reached the conclusion that we have a lot of things in common. Uh, I also gave a similar talk in, at Eurocamp in Potsdam some weeks ago, and we ended up understanding that, yes, we do have something in common about our educational system. So I would like to hear your opinion if you want to share with me. I'm going to leave my Twitter account or my uh, email address at the end of the presentation. And we can, we can share some experiences. I mean, the subject is really wide. I mean, and again, we come from different cultures. So uh, that would be very interesting to hear different points of views. Uh, before uh, talking about these points that I want to show you, why am I talking about math and physics at Froscon? We just came up of, you know, uh, a talk about databases, about, uh, I don't know, clusters, about uh, kernel, about anything. Why am I talking about math and physics? So, for instance, uh, how many of you attended college or university or are in between attending and getting your diploma. Uh, did you have any class about math and physics? Most of you, yes. Even if we are not into college, during uh, our school times, we do have a lot of uh, hours dedicated to math. I don't know about you, but I remember when I was like, 11, 12, and doing math homework, and it was like a big list of exercises, and I had to solve them and deliver. And on the other day, someone showed like, hey, this is this equation. And I got another list, and I had to solve and deliver. And then again, was it similar for you? So yeah, so we, we can share some. Um, some aspects in common about how frustrating is this process and about the problems that 
we generate by having this kind of process into our educational system. Um, so I would like to talk about a little bit about the structure of my uh, engineering course. So I had all the subjects uh, related to math and physics. I don't know about you, but uh, in Brazil, we have a course of a five year course for engineering, and we saw everything. Like, at least they try to push a lot of content to you. And everything is based on that loop. Like, you get a subject, someone shows you an equation, a concept, sometimes a vague concept, like, hey, this is Maxwell's equation. And then they give you a long list of uh, problems to solve, and then you need to deliver. And again, why are you doing this? So have you ever asked yourself, like, why do I need to deliver this list? You, where you get the content that you saw, you, in a mechanical way, you apply this, and you deliver, and you get a grade, and then you restart the process. So like, should science be like this? I don't know. For me, it was really frustrating. Uh, it was really, really frustrating. Uh, so when I was a child, uh, I started having math classes, and the professors asked me, like, solve this equation. My first reaction to this was like, why? And they're like, because yes. It's like, no, it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make, it's not logical. Why are you solving an equation? You need to give me context. Uh, where am I going to use this? Maxwell equation, why do you use Maxwell equations? I don't know. Did you know when you learned? Did someone tell you, hey, you are going to use this to understand um, fiber networks? People didn't tell me. I was totally frustrated. What was that triangle in the middle of the equation? What, what is this? Who, who was the person who came, who came up with this idea of the triangle in the middle of the equation? How come? I don't know about you, but I was really frustrated. I had all these questions, and usually when the professors came to show me a new concept, they didn't tell me these things. So it was, I was, you know, accumulating frustration. That, that's bad. Uh, so what I saw from, from uh, all this scenario is like, in many cases, not all of the cases, we, our, our contact with science at school is without context. I don't know if, it, if the sentence is valid in Germany, but at least in Latin America, or I would risk to say in America, this is what happens most of the times. You are introduced to a mechanical tool, but they never, or at least rarely, they tell you where you are effectively going to use this. And this is really bad. OK. Uh, and I think this lack of context uh, makes us confused. Uh, or sometimes it generates something even worse. Have you heard some friend of you saying, like, I hate calculus? I did. And for example, I have Instagram. And I was like, hey, let me search for calculus in Instagram. So I searched for calculus. And you see a lot of pictures, at least like half of pictures with someone with a sad face and hashtag hate calculus. Hey, I have a math test tomorrow, I hate it. Why do you hate it? It's cool. Uh, sometimes the, the way that the professor show you a, con a concept leads you to hate, or even a fake hate, but you know, some, some sensation of um, uncomfortable. You feel uncomfortable with that. Uh, so, wow, uh, and, and this is even worse. Uh, so, I started studying by myself, understanding some concepts, and, well, I like math. And I went to an online course with a lot of other students around the world, and by the end of the course, we had to provide feedback to each other. And this feedback was for me. 
So basically, someone told me that I was not being human when presenting uh, my results, because they were like two without context. They were pure numbers. And so this, is, this feedback was for me. And after that, I was totally afraid. I was like, mm, I am worried about science. I am worried about education. And I am not being human enough. So I need to think about the situation. Uh, and again, I started to think, how can I humanize uh, math and physics, or at least how I think it should be? Uh, so I, I, I thought about a group of techniques, some of them I could apply in Brazil, uh, that could help us to understand the context behind of what we are learning. And the first thing I saw and tried effectively was telling the story behind a context. So for example, let's get calculus. When I say calculus, which names of people comes to your mind? One name, just one. What is the first name? Euler. Gauss. Yeah. But history tells us that the, 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 mo the main figures are Leibniz. I don't know how to say this in proper uh, pronounce in German, sorry. Uh, but the other very, very important figure who nobody told me in calculus one, two, three, or four is Newton. And he is very, very important. And how many professors like spend 10 minutes telling the story of Newton and calculus? When I was at, uh, at university, nobody even mentioned the name Newton. Because Newton is the guy of the falling apple. Uh, no, no, the things are not like this. So I found much more pleasure in math and physics after reading some story behind. Because by reading some story behind the concept, this started to remind me that the, the people who made this, they are also human beings, just like me. So, you know, when you find a common point between the, the, the subjects, and you feel the subject somewhat uh, closer to you, this, this is valid. Uh, so I told some professors that, hey, what do you think of telling the story behind uh, the, the formula or the equation or the concept? And they said, oh, that's, that's definitely a great idea. Let's start the session. And then they started lecture like, in 19th century, someone did this. This is not telling the story behind, just for information. I mean, so don't, don't, I mean, when I tell the story behind, I don't mean uh, giving give me a reference of time. I want to know the story of the person. Uh, so yeah, and I started reading a little bit about uh, some equations and who created them or what is the context involved into them. And you find very interesting uh, things and stories on, on these topics. For example, you have a lot of family dramas. Uh, someone who comes from a very, very poor family and the father uh, try to hide math from the young, the young child, afraid that the young child becomes a mathematician. And becoming a mathematician would mean that he would be poor for the rest of his life. And then you have stories like this, so fathers uh, trying to hide all the math books from the kids. Uh, and then the kids started developing the math by yourself. And it's really beautiful. You have also, uh, I, I'm going to talk about the deaths later, but <laughs> it's, it's also interesting. Uh, but you have like totally random facts. So uh, you have some people during the uh, 16th something who created the first portable calculator. And that's super cool. I mean, you can't imagine a portable calculator by 16 something. And there are people who try to make this. Uh, there is also a lot of uh, arguments and discussions between uh, some people who actually uh, created very important concepts. For example, uh, 
we probably have heard about probability and statistics. So there's a great name behind this, and uh, th this guy is uh, Girolamo Cardano. Girolamo Cardano, he's an Italian. And this guy is very famous because he wanted to argue to everyone. And many people hated him. And he has a very fancy story. I mean, uh, he wanted to argue and discuss with everyone, but he has a very tragical family history. So for example, he had some child and he was, um, he was just, he was killed, kind of, I mean, uh, not killed, but he went to jail because of his son. So his son put him to jail, his own father. So this is really tragic. I mean, you can easily write a movie or a novel with the story of these people. Uh, so yeah, uh, the first, uh, the first thing that, the first story actually, that really uh, shocked me was Kepler's story. Do you know, have you heard, have you read something about Kepler? When I say Kepler, what does come to your mind? The first thing, sorry? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, in, in, when people tell me Kepler, the first thing that comes to my mind is Kepler's laws, <laughs> which is sad. Uh, but yeah, uh, so the first thing uh, I think it's Kepler's, uh, I think it's Kepler's laws, but you can also think uh, about some persecutions and chases. So this guy was literally hunt by a Catholic church. I mean, in terms of he, if he left his house, there would be someone following him. Um, so the the history behind uh, is something like that. So when Kepler was living, uh, the Catholic Church basically forced people to believe that the Earth was the center of everything, which was against uh, Kepler's idea and which was also against uh, the real physical system behind. So uh, Kepler was following Copernicus ideas. Uh, which basically put the sun into the center and makes sense. But according to Catholic Church, it would be bad. It would be a crime. So people shouldn't believe this. And Kepler should not spread his crazy ideas. So he was considered someone dangerous and he should be hunt. But of course, they, they, they had not a solid uh, argument to kill him or arrest him. So they should chase him, and in the first wrong movement, he would be arrested and killed. So this is a very sad story because the guy was just doing science. He was observing planets, and there is someone chasing you, persecuting you, killing your family, so that, that's horrible. Another very random interesting fact about Kepler, do you like Star Wars? Do you like science fiction books, I do. And probably he is the author of the first science fiction book. He wrote a book about an expedition to the moon. Did someone tell you about this? This book is super cool. I mean, in 16 something, someone told about an expedition to the moon. Because, I don't know, that, that's fantastic. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the first uh, books about real science fiction published in the world. So it's, it's amazing. You, you should take a look at this book. The, you can download for free to the internet. <coughs> um, and Kepler comes from a very, very poor family. And he could, you know, evolve his research just because of a rich friend, Taisho. And when Taisho died, his only protection also died. So as Taisho was very rich, he usually didn't have much trouble with Catholic Church. But when he died, and he died very young, because of a Bohemian life that he, that he had, uh, again, Kepler saw himself alone again. And imagine yourself struggling 
with you know some sort of persecution. That's horrible. That's really horrible. So Kepler spent most of his life alone into a castle studying planets. That, that's really sad. Uh, so yeah, when I was at, at university, nobody, or even at school, nobody told me about Kepler's story. But there is a lot of benefits if we try to teach uh, Kepler's laws plus this uh, historical happenings. So, for example, you, we, we could create a bridge between innocence, which is a, a subject that we study in history, with science. So when you connect uh, different topics, sometimes they, they make much more sense. So you can explain the Catholic Church uh, persecutions, the Inquisition, and give real examples of people who suffered the, the, the problem. Um, and again, you can actually show examples of literature of science fiction, which is fantastic. I love this example. Uh, another, another. Uh, some of you mentioned Euler. Euler has a very, very, very interesting story. Uh, probably the chance of of you having read something about Euler is, is I think, is higher. Have you heard or read something about Euler, about his history, not not the, what he did? And this question is tricky. What does come to your mind when someone says Euler? It's really hard because he acted in so many areas. And you have like Euler's identity, Euler's formula, Euler's uh, plan, Euler's something, Euler's t-shirt. You have many things related to Euler. And it's hard to, to select something. Um, for you, I don't know if you, if you know about this, but when Euler died, uh, he, he had written so many things that the publishers is still publishing very new and fresh content after 50 years of his death. It, it is a lot of things. And, and not because they, they couldn't find the, the new content, because they, they didn't have space, or they hadn't understood the meaning of the paper. So Euler was a person who wrote a lot, a lot, a lot of things. And that, that's very interesting. Uh, and Euler has a very uh, inclusive fact. Uh, he, he, he got blind. And even blind, he was still doing math. So when I read this, I was, I think I was like 14 or something. I was shocked because I was thinking, like, I can do math with both eyes. He can make it blind. So he became an, a life example for me. Uh, that was very something, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a motivation. Uh, so, oops, sorry. Uh, another interesting thing about Euler, which I started studying just because of, you know, reading his life story, was uh, mental calculation techniques. Have heard about something about this? Which is very interesting. You can find yourself, you know, solving, uh, I don't know, uh, multiplications, divisions, very, in a very efficient way, way more efficient than solving into the paper pencil. And again, Euler was very well known by his his ability to solve uh, some sort of crazy equations mentally. And he had to improve those skills when he got blind because he. He couldn't write, so he was able, he memorized like the, the, the multiplication tables of 600 numbers. But that, that's crazy, and he wrote into his, uh, his diary that, hey, I memorized this and I can, now I can solve this, this entire system in my head, and that's crazy. That's really crazy. Uh, we have some benefits, again, if we teach, uh, the, the concepts that Euler uh, related with history. So, for example, uh, it's it's a, a clear case of motivational. Uh, you can also teach uh, magical issues. So, 
For example, if you are into a biology class and you are teaching uh, illness that can, let it, that can make you blind, you can mention Euler's example. Uh, you can also use this with children to avoid bullying with someone, I don't know, uh, with someone with disabilities. Uh, and one last example about Euler, I have time for this. Uh, he was blind and he could calculate something, an equation about the moon, blind. So he, he, he just concluded this with math, with pure math. And, you know, so again, disabilities shouldn't stop you to do things. Um, so again, uh, I don't know about you, but I found this, this story is very, very interesting. And I think they could become movies. I mean, how many movies about scientists do we have? We have much more movies about Superman, about Marvel. About, I think they are, again, they are very, very cool. But we don't have the same amount of movies with the scientists. And every time you go to study history, you find new names, new, you know, new stories to tell. And sometimes these stories, they, they get out of focus. Uh, so another technique, uh, make more movies about science. Uh, so there is, there is this person, Evarist Galois, which I really think someone should make a move about him. Have you heard about this, this, this guy? So he's the, the person behind group theory. But his life story is a tragedy, and he's the, the example of tragical death. Uh, what would I suggest for a Galois movie? Uh, you can put lots of topics about French history, which is important. Um, you can also tell that someone that does math can be, can also, you know, be part of rebellions and revolutions and so on. Uh, for instance, Galois suffered a lot with this because he was at the university. He was, you know, very active into the, the political uh, the political field of his time, and so he started developing group theory. But he never had a paper accepted because when people took his papers, they were like, uh, "This guy is from politics; he can't do math. What is he doing here? Just you know, let's ignore this paper. I won't lose time with this." And they they put his papers aside. So imagine the frustration of this person. He's doing a brilliant math work, but people refuse themselves to read just because they think, oh, he's a revolutionary. Uh, probably he can't do math. So it's a fight against stereotypes. Uh, so we can talk about all these topics. And again, he had a very tragical death. Uh, so he was arrested due to political issues. And he fell in love with a young woman who history believes that was involved with the opposition. So he, he was in love with her, and she was engaged with another person. And by that time, duels were very common. So uh, Galois was requested to have a duel with the, the girl's fiance. And he was shot in the back, and he passed away when he was 20. Um, so yeah, we can talk about all this, this drama into a movie. And of course, we can mention something very important, which is group theory. Uh, but again, it's, it's not a side subject. But we, we could properly tell uh, a very interesting movie about, about his life story. Um, so just enforcing, when we tell things about science, it's important to tell that there, is, there are people behind it, just you know, people like me, like you. Um, I personally think that his, this movie technique worked a lot for Alan Turing. Uh, for instance, I host some pages about Alan Turing in Brazil, and after the movie, they, they totally increase it. The, the access, and you see people asking questions about his life, about his works. You see people getting interested in computer science, mainly because of the movie. 
So I really think that movies work. Media content, like movies, when they are well done, they, they really have a positive impact into people. Uh, so I, I, I really think we, we should try to make more movies about other, uh, other people in science. Uh, so the final part of the presentation is about how to apply these techniques into computer science. Uh, I believe that most of you are involved or have some contact with programming. So, and I believe that most of you uh, had some contact with math, physics. So how do we combine them? Because sometimes I feel that these fields are like islands. They are totally isolated and they are not. So. Uh, so the, the last thing I would like to show you is some real examples, uh, which some of them I was able to try and see the results. So the first thing I was able to try was teaching numerical methods with uh, algorithms. And that's actually a good idea. It, it sounds very obviously, but for, I mean, usually you have separate subjects, right? Algorithms, one, two, three and numerical methods, one, two. And what we did, we unified them. So we had, we literally had the subject, algorithms and numerical methods. Sounds cool. And when I was like in my first years of uh, university, I was way more motivated to the algorithms class than the numerical methods class. You know, well, I, I wanted to write code and see and compile things and make things happen. And so I, so yeah, I had a test of algorithms and data structures and a test of numerical methods. So I probably would dedicate five hours to study one subject and one hour to the other, which is maybe it's not fair, but it's related to interests. So by unifying them, we saw like besides the better the better grades, we saw way more you know interest of the students because they saw something real being applied. So they had to build an efficient algorithm to the numerical method works. So they had the perspective is different. Uh, I don't know if uh, again we, we come from different cultures, but in Brazil it's not that common. We usually have separate subjects. And by unifying them, we saw very positive results. Uh, and again, one thing that I asked the, the, the professors to do was like, hey, can you please tell the story behind this numerical method? Who created this? Why the person did this? And the same thing for the algorithm. Another very interesting uh, unification that we tried was like the teaching UI and UX with statistics. So, uh, how many of you work with front-end? So few of you work with front-end, but some things that, I, that we usually need to uh, provide is A-B tests, and we need to evaluate these A-B tests, uh, or we need to collect data from our users and analyze them. What do you do with this data? How do I know if this button is into the right position? So does the user feel comfortable with this button? And you need to collect this data and analyze it. And again, analyzing this data that you collect from A-B tests is purely statistics. So yeah, we also saw very positive results from this. Um, so what do we saw here? Uh, we saw very stimulated students in the positive way. I mean, people really enjoyed this unification. Of course, we screwed up some things. Uh, for example, we had to cut some information from statistics that we should cover. Uh, but again, the unification caused a very positive impact. Uh, it's not everything is going to be perfect. So, for example, by the end of the, the period, we had to uh, you know, show something that we hadn't covered, like, hey, this is Poisson distribution, and I don't, I can't think an application for this with UI and UX, but in general, it was way better. Um, so, some final messages. Uh, we, we have several lectures here at Froscon, 
Uh, for example, we have lectures about databases, about management, about DevOps, about clusters. So I don't know about you, but I've seen that we've been trying to unify the areas in, into a software development conference uh, because it's important to give a general overview and make people, you know, at least have a better understood of other parts of software development. But again, we've we. We are walking to the unification of this. What about walking to a more general unification? What about now walking to a unification of uh, math, physics, chemistry, and other subjects to computer science? Because it's interesting, after working for some years into computer science, with software development, with hardware development, you see that this kind of uh, job impacts into very different areas. So today you can be working with a medical system, tomorrow with, I don't know, an educational system. And again, we should look, in my honest opinion, to a better unification of this. Because math and physics, they have a lot to do with computers. And they are the pure basis for this. Uh, one behavior that I saw when we started creating these unified ideas was people blaming, oh, this student's fault because they're not interested in learning, or it's professor's fault because they don't want to talk about this, they just want to grab the, the, the exercise list and give us uh, some final grades. And again, don't waste your time blaming people. Use your time to, to properly produce some content that might help people. Uh, I have a small contribution here. I wrote a lot of blog posts with uh, short stories about the, the life story of scientists and how they discovered some topics. I mean, it's all of them are like three to five minutes read. I mean, my idea was like, hey, if someone opens and randomly pick up a blog post, they can spend like three or five minutes reading this without getting tired. Uh, because I understand that sometimes you get a book of 400 pages about Kepler. It's a lot of time. So yeah, this is my small contribution. Uh, I believe that we all can, oh, it should be a gift. It died. Uh, but it's someone drinking coffee. Yeah, great. I believe that all of us, we can, we can uh, have a better relationship with math and physics. For instance, after I, I have, I do have time. Uh, for instance, uh, I've been doing math for pure hobby, and that's very interesting because I started studying group theory, category theory, and it it made me a, a person way more creative. I can now think about category theory and apply them to graphs. So when I go to explain graphs to someone, I can also explain category theory and, you know, you start developing some sort of new ideas. And you see that when I talk, for example, to some mathematician friends, they sometimes they tell me, hey, I have this problem. I, I created this equation, but I can test this. And I can test this because, I don't know, my, uh, I only know my SQL, and my SQL can handle this amount of data. And you go to the person and say, hey, uh, let me introduce you, Cassandra. And they were like, whoa, now I can test my equation. And then they publish the paper, which is incredible. So we can help them, and they can help us, because of his idea. It's like, hmm, what if I apply this to neural networks? It's a group theory, has everything to do. But up to then, I had, you know, I had never heard something about this, this idea of group theory, and he could show me. So yeah, we can, you know, extend knowledge. And sometimes I felt totally blind when developing uh, just websites, because I, I, I couldn't feel that I was in the edge. So, what are the challenges that we are actually trying to, to create, to write papers, to, you know, what, we, we have a limit for computers. What do you have, you know, above this? 
what we don't know. And I believe that people from math, people from physics, people from chemistry, we need to work together because we can, we can see uh, proper solutions for this when we are working together. Because I don't have the, no the knowledge that a mathematician has, but sometimes I have a solution that he or she needs, and vice versa. I don't know if it's, it's already happened to you, but happens to me very often. So we should, in my honest opinion, interact more. And how can we interact more? I've been trying to get some uh, mathematician, physics, physicians, and so on uh, to computer uh, computer science conference, just like Frascon, just like the conference that we have in Brazil. And they are trying to get me into their conference so we can exchange knowledge. But again, this is just a small work. So to 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 summarize all my ideas, I think that we should maybe work together and maybe, you know, spend some time into the, the borderline, the, the edge of the problems that we have in computer science and grab them, grab their help and help them with their problems. Because probably we have uh, a good a good role to execute on that. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, we do have time for questions, right? So, yeah. Does anybody has any question? Any comments? I think. I waited some time with IDC Kodakista. Maybe it will be good because he had a lot of problems in his life, like yeah. medicine. And he's, he had like, still we, we didn't make his, you know, pawn, pawns. Still we, we haven't established, like, the transmission of power, wireless transmission of power. So he had lots of problems. I think it will be a good. To, to mention, yeah, definitely agree. Tesla has a, a, a very sad story. I think it's, oh, uh, the, the, com oh, okay. So yeah, uh, the, the question was, uh, wasn't a question, was a comment to add uh, some comments about Nikola Tesla because he also has a very uh, interesting life story and he's very important to humanity, especially to communications. Thank you. So any other comments, questions? Can you? Thank you. Okay, the, the I sh sorry, I need to repeat your question. So the question was if there is any kind of research showing uh, the benefits of unifying the areas when you teach uh, topics together that might have a correlation. Well, I don't know any. I know some papers about education, general education, not focused for computer science, who cares about the subject, uh, mainly for, uh, you know, connecting uh, common areas and creating a, a bigger picture. So we try to apply this general idea. But still, it's very hard to, to provide this. When I left the university, they don't do this anymore. They, they, they just stop it. So, <laughs> yeah. So still, it's, 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 it's very hard to, to provide some change. So I was a student by that time, and I just suggested. Uh, so I, I did some sort of mentoring 
I don't know if it's a proper word, like just you know, went throwing ideas and we had some professors who, you know, they, they agreed. They, they agree with, with the idea and they volunteered to, to make this kind of thing. But again, it wasn't even official. <laughs> so uh, we, by the end of 2014, I suggested this in two other institutions and they are you know, planning this, but I'm sorry. Um, okay, so it's not working. It's not, okay. so, uh, just, just a comment. I'm a teacher in math and physics, and I don't have time to do this with every equation. I have um, I, I do this in physics. I always introduce the, the physicist who did this or did that, and I notice an increase in interest, but just for a short while. It just it's it's an interest in the person, but still, ten minutes later they ask, "Why do I need to do this?" So, it does yeah. not always correlate. I, I totally agree with you. Uh, I don't know about the background, but this this also happened to me and to some talks. Uh, I host some meetups, right? So let let's. It's not a formal lecture. I don't have grades or nothing, but I have meetups, and for the first ten minutes it works, and then the person gets aware, start tweeting. Uh, so what I saw is that first we have a deeper uh, educational problem. The person's not to use it to this. So I need to understand that they are not to use it. The second factor is like probably they are tired. So I usually host meetups on Saturdays during the morning and the person worked for the entire week and he or she is there. So probably he, he or she is tired. I have to fight against this. That's why I post some GIFs. Sounds like stupid, but sometimes works because the person like, why there is a dog GIF in the middle of a presentation? And they, they wake up again. They put the cell phone back and they work for extra 10 minutes. So after talking to uh, some uh, so social science friends, they mentioned all these points, like probably it's something that should take years to make some visible effect you know, in, a, in a first moment sounds like frustrating for who is there spending their energy to you know create a very new entirely educational system but take some time especially I believe for other human factors it's nothing to do you know with with your lecture that that's what I saw into the meetups mostly. Any other questions? So I'll be around. Oh, sorry. OK, I, it's, it's not working. <laughs> it's, it's not working. But I can, I can cross the. It's a psychological microphone. You just <laughs> hold and you just have to put it on. <laughs> Great. So much for science. Um, what I did want to ask is, um, and I may use some harsh words, but, um, but uh, do you really think that turning Turing's life in a sort of soap opera is uh, really serving science? I, I don't think that. And I think um, it's nice to to see biopics about uh, scientists. By the way, Batman was scientist. Uh, but to um, to evoke uh, uh, interest in pupils and students, um, you must uh, you must present the science um, in a sort that they can. Uh, th that they can use in, in their life with their problems. And if they have in such problems, then it's um, it's the, uh, it's a task of the teacher to create projects and so so that they can use it. That's my opinion. Uh, and you addressed it, yeah. but you laid a more 
uh, more white on the um, on the dramatic part, and I, that's not my thing. So, uh, I would like to quickly reply you that, of course, it's not logical to uh, apply to the drama, but I come from a country where sometimes you don't even have a desk into the classroom. So I can provide, you know, equipment for creating an experiment. It's, it would be super cool, but the children sometimes they don't have a place to sit. They need to sit on the floor. So, so sometimes you have a lack of resource and sometimes you, you need to tell the story that, hey, there were some people who had a horrible situation just like you do, just like we do. And let's keep moving. Uh, so I totally agree that when you have the chance, you need to show something practical. For example, uh, one thing that I've tried once was like teaching electricity and you know showing some experiments related to light because we had light in the room, which is basic, but we could show. So like again, uh, when you you do have something to use, uh, as the, the 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 professor mentioned, like she 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 gives us real examples in your physics class. Sometimes it's it's easy, but what you do when first you don't have any sort of basic resource, just like a desk, and what you do when this is just for thinking, uh, what you do when the thing is really really abstract. Really, I mean, you have some areas in math that are really, really, really abstract. And it's hard to, to show this to a children of, I don't know, maybe five years old. So again, uh, I don't, I totally agree with what you said, but still, uh, it's, I think there is no perfect technique. Maybe combining them. I just want to reply to that because I'm right now at the moment, I teach eight, eight graders and they want to know why do I have to learn linear equations? And I don't know. I'm a math teacher and I don't know. Beyond saying that it's a tool that you'll need later, later on. Can you pass the mic? <laughs> I, I think we can all understand. No, they, they, they are recording. Thank you. I don't know all the English words for that, but um, I think one uh, approach would be uh, not to, uh, to isolate problems, but uh, creating bigger projects. In this case, maybe uh, a start, uh, make a startup with them. I yes? Have, I have Mo oh, yeah. I didn't blame the teacher. That's that's in the structures. You're right. Yes. Yeah. You you should have the time, and you should have a time to connect to other teachers and create such uh, such uh, environments to learn uh, connected. Yeah. Ich hoffe, das klar geworden, was ich gesagt habe. <laughs> Yeah, um, that's that's my uh, that's that's all in my mind. Entschuldigung. Yeah, but uh, who should it do if not you or me? I, I'm not I'm not a teacher. I have to fight at another front. <laughs> Okay, just for the record, uh, this humanizing math has the problem that very often math history starts with some dehumanization by the parents saying, 
oh, don't worry about math, I hated it as well. But uh, um, this is one point. Um, in my experience with more or less everyone, I tried to tell something about math. I never met anybody who didn't understand if the time was taken, that means if the structures are to cram masses of content into functional units, um, there is no hope. But if you have the time to speak from person to person, um, nobody has to release uh, all hope. That's the first one. And the second one is, um, I think it's very important um, to insist on, if you want to have it humanized, there is a limit which can be stuffed into people. And this means you don't have um, classes of 25 or something and schedules of 31. So, and there it starts. So, uh, a lot of points here. Uh, the first, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, we have some sort of cultural problems. I think I mentioned this to you. Uh, these cultural problems, sometimes they start very early with your parents, like, hey, math is difficult, don't, don't worry. Uh, that's a stereotype. And I, I, I've heard that. Uh, some of my friends also heard that. So this is a, this is a pure stereotype. Uh, so a point of teaching people, sometimes you're not interested. I can't do some sort of things like singing. I can't sing. And I believe that I can learn because you know I don't want. So some people might have the same problem. I mean, they 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 don't want. We we can put some efforts. We can teach the basics, but they don't like it. We need to accept that some people won't like it. But again, uh, some other reason for mentioning the movies is that I think media uh, creates interest on people. So I have some friends that. They didn't care for you no know, computer science history, but after Alan Turing movie, they're like, "Hey, this sounds interesting." So again, uh, can be the only source of motivation, but media is—I think it's a great tool because sometimes this kind of media can compensate the, the lack of hours that you don't have, and the person sometimes goes to the cinema and get a movie session about this, and sometimes, you know, it's just an extra tool. To that that you know can, can be provided. Uh, again, this is a very wide topic. Uh, I, I hope I had you know brought some new and fresh ideas to you, especially in terms of working together. We had two people uh, changing ideas, different experiences. I think we should do this more often, especially because we come from different cultures, different realities, and that that's you know. That's a unique experience. How can we improve science? Sometimes we need more communication with different areas. That, that's my, my personal opinion too. Uh, do you have time for one more or two minutes? Can I make it? Um, actually, like, um, I think like we forget like the point we are like in the digital like, communication like world. So if we use the social media like some kind of um, LinkedIn or uh, Facebook or some kind like um, website for the student, so the people they can encourage, like um, increase their knowledge and they can share the knowledge about like science as well. If we like join the university or the school for that, so the uh, uh, like uh, we can have extra work outside the, the university time. So I think like um, with these social media, which have like some kind of applied mathematics, uh, some something like which increase the thinking of the student, uh, give some kind of <coughs> a problem, and uh, those people who can solve it, you give a prize for them. So I think like this also could help more for this uh, like which we called it some kind of distance education. If we involve the, the school for that, I think this will be very, very helpful. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. We ran out of time. Hope you have enjoyed.